А Морпа Цунгард в 1999-2008 годах являлся заместителем директора и куратором Музея современного искусства в Роскилде, а также главой наблюдательного совета по культуре и членом форума новых медиа Министерства культуры Дании, а реализовал целый ряд кураторских проектов, а в частности фестиваль цифрового искусства «Ньюн» в Копенгагене, раздел скандинавского авангарда в рамках выставки Sound Art, Sound Art is Medium в центре современного искусства и медиа в Калсуе ЗКМ и целый ряд других проектов совместно с Питером Вайбелем и совместно другой ряд проектов с Лаурой Белов, нашей коллегой, которая также будет выступать позже. Название лекции Мортона Сонегарта звучит как «Жизнь, в которой мы живем. Исследование метафор глубоких медиа в искусстве и иных политических формах жизни». Um, and thank you for the, to the team as well. Uh, it's an, an amazing exhibition. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I added a little bit to the title. Um, uh, the life lived by it should be with a question mark actually in the program, but I just added what is posthuman life just to uh, underline that this is a study of immediate metaphors in our other political life forms which will take us uh, in various directions and not come up with uh, de definitive uh, answers, uh, no, no definitions as such. Um, so, let me start by unfolding a bit uh, the title, uh, and especially the, the concepts of metaphor, and uh, a little bit also the post-human life bit, but it's, it's already been discussed uh, by this morning's uh, presenters. So, mainly, mostly the, the metaphor part. In this, uh, also in the, in, the, in the abstract, I'm mentioning uh, kind of a historicity of, of the ways that we have approached how we use, uh, how metaphors are operational in our uh, 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 horizons of understanding, uh, not only media, but also art and other phenomena, of course. But here, I want to uh, emphasize metaphors as means of studying the entanglements of our media and life. Uh, metaphors are themselves also a medium uh, between the world we interpret and the, the, that which we cannot interpret. So it's a sort of a borderline reality test uh, for entangled life forms in my conception here. Uh, and my, the background uh, for this is Michel Serre, uh, Bruno Latour, and Donna Haraway, as I'm going to quote in a moment, and in each their different ways. Um, uh, they work with metaphors to approach, and, and other uh, figures as well, as, uh, as a matter of fact, to approach and think beyond the thresholds of knowledge and cabinet, finding different ways to address the relation between life and objects in situations where there are no such conventional relations. So in this talk, I will investigate deep media through the metaphors of what may be post-human life or cultural representation, suffering any fixed definitions of post-media, um, uh, or post-human life for that matter. But I will be pointing out some trajectories based on three cases from my own practice. Um, as a practice-based research curator, I, I work uh, with practice-based uh, methodologies, uh, both as a curator and as, a, as an academic. So, I'm uh, very much impacted by uh, the, the thinking of Donna Haraway, um, and as I said, also Michel Serre and, and Bruno Latour, but especially, uh, here I have a quote from Donna Haraway from Situated Knowledge, um, 
that we must take into account, uh, we must take account of the structure of facts and artifacts, as well as the language mediated actors in the knowledge game. And here, of course, the metaphors are these language mediated actors uh, in my conceptions of them. And here, artifacts and facts are part of the powerful art of rhetoric, practice and illustration, and the focus is very much on practice. And of course, there are gives and takes here that they are not perfect instruments, metaphors. They are actually very imperfect, as you will discover. Um, but they are means uh, to which I can speak about these things in this talk. Yes. So let me begin. This takes me to my first, uh, my first example uh, to, to try and set the, the, the stage for this. Uh, the cosmological stage, as we heard before, uh, is maybe a very good term for it, actually. And this is uh, a project I'm working on together with uh, an artist, uh, Edmita Ruhr, a Danish artist, and also Amy Wolseholk, also Danish. Um, on, the, on the work of Elsebli Pell, who was uh, an electronic musician. She was a, part, a member of the Schaeffer group. Um, she was uh, 16, she was uh, in, the, in a concentration camp during the Second World War, because she was uh, in the resistance. And that marked her artistic life uh, uh, throughout her career. She died two years ago. But when we filmed this in 2012, um, she, uh, she had a, a severe case of dementia. So she had lost the sense of her cultural entanglement. Um, so in the video, you will see the composer in her, in her well, she's in her 90s, 92, late age, listening to her own composition called Faust, uh, which is from 1962. And to, due to this slowly increasing state of dementia, Esmeri Pell is sliding in and out of different states of consciousness, more or less provoked by her own composition and by the condition conditions of the shared social situation of listening and recording. So while filming her, and while we're working with it right now, actually we filmed this in 12, and now we're working with it, making it into, I don't know what to call it, it's not really an artwork, but it's also, it's this hybrid state of, of, of um, documentation, art, uh, science, uh, uh, and research. But while we were filming her, we recorded the random everyday sounds of her, her close environment as well, in the nursery home, and the situation of collective listening that she was in. But what motivated us uh, that afternoon in 2012, where we came armed with camera, a microphone, and a bag of cakes, was a sense of urgency. Elsmi Pell was at the edge of her life, a composer sliding in and out of an intellectual clarity, and then emotional states of mind, balancing between blankness, alertness, lucidity, and dementia. It, it, it appeared as if there was only a narrow window in which this was, uh, in which that was very special and somehow floating state of mind was accessible due to her, this new state of living. And that's take a So this is the sound is from her work. And the footage, which is a single length mediation, of course, reveals to a degree how she's sliding in and out of what appears to be a meter space of a life lived by. Past, resonating, yet another indeterminate past, and so on. 
So you have this resonant, uh, resonance chamber almost of her own listening to her own self and then having these few uh, recognitions uh, going on. So there's an unwriting, an unlistening, an unintention uh, going on. So are we to say that this is a deep media situation? And is it then a transhumanism, a kind of new vitalism? Or should it be understood as a techniques, a cultural expression of post-human life, enabled by the camera and machines recording the acts of dementia? So what is memory? It's really the metaphor I'm starting. Memory is... And this locks into a discussion of cultural techniques that having throughout this uh, talk, where you can see the, the, a different way of, of um, acknowledging how uh, artists are working or maybe that art can be put into uh, play in this uh, recognition of uh, deep media metaphors. Here from uh, Kramer and Bredekamp, uh, the, 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 the quote here says that skill and knowledge are going uh, separate ways. Uh, the daily use of operative science removes the burden and complexities of interpretation. Calculus is always already a kind of mechanism of forgetting. And in order to calculate correctly, we don't need to be able to provide an answer to the question, what is a zero? So you have this, as I see it, the situation of uh, a calculus being repeated. There's a forgetting going on, but there's also uh, a new kind of, let's say, remembering, uh, a new kind of bringing things back. And the question is how this uh, 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 gets into a cultural representation. That is my question. So what is memory? Um, the second, the second uh, metaphor I would like to uh, negotiate here and, and, and examine is, is, uh, is the threshold. So, in, in, the, in the work of Elsmir Pell, this, uh, this caption, we had a sense of a threshold just after she has lost the, the memory of her own work and then she's reconnecting to it, re-listening to it in a different way, rewriting it perhaps even, you could say, in this calculus way more than in a, in a, in a, in a symbolic way. So the threshold, there's a threshold somewhere in, in, the, in, in the situation with Esmeric Hill. And this threshold, I would like to take you uh, a little further, the, the question of what is the threshold, the, the metaphor here, what would that be for post-human life? And for that, I would like to uh, bring on a, a second case, um, uh, with it, which is uh, another Danish artist called Tokian Dawson. Uh, who did a number of projects uh, with uh, data visualization. So not in pursuit of answers here still, but rather in pursuit of the right framework to investigate these questions. Torbjörn Lausten as well is uh, using his uh, practice with data and his artistic methods of re researching reality constructs from uh, the outside uh, reality, what is outside the, the human field, the non-human, <coughs> Uh, territory, as we heard it um, uh, also mentioned. So, Tobin Lauston, and this is one of his images, uh, a, a, a diagram of sunspots, is an example. I will show you some footage in a moment. So, he's operating in this vast and complex field of, uh, of that we are addressing here, art and technology and science. But he enhances this uh, into an aesthetic field into, uh, by exploring. Uh, methods to access and show data from scientific measurements uh, like sunspots, magnetism and meteorology. And this is projects that are 10 years, 12 years, 14 years old. Um, and uh, they, they are, this artistic exploration seemed to me to be relevant, especially in the context of this uh, exhibition, which of course shows examples of uh, newer works that are going into similar questions in this aesthetic threshold how to negotiate that. But back in this time, and he actually starts in this process already in the 1970s, 1970s, this artistic exploration is conducted as a dialectics of what I would like to propose as an optics and an opsis. 
So an ongoing investigation of ways of mediating and performing data in real time. Roy Ascot, for instance, in his practice, is playing with the field of textual and diagrammical uh, data as paradoxical information spaces that questions the constructions uh, of optics by a conventional uh, visual system, which should also be understood, I would claim, as a kind of performative perceptual framing, watch what is the first kind of uh, understanding what an opsis is. So opsis, it will appear, is a strategy in, in Tokyo and Larson's work to operate with information from beyond this, uh, this uh, human uh, horizon, the, the post-human uh, post uh, world, where, however large it is and however we want to, to approach it, which is also one of the problems we are uh, facing and hence the use of metaphor. Uh, perceptually available to an audience using scientific measure, uh, measuring methods and digital technologies. But the difference between an optical representation and an opposite could be pointed uh, out in, in the following way. Optics, in the first instance, refers to special qualities of light as a physical phenomenon. Secondly, it refers to the human physiology that makes sight possible, the retina and the visual system, and psychologically and, and, and cognitively the visual system. Thirdly, it refers generally to optical instruments, mechanical and technological methods of seeing or sensing that which is far away or simply outside our perceptual range. Uh, range. So optics is a way of looking at the world, this uh, very classical uh, way of, of having a, a, you could say, renaissance a science uh, uh, perspective on how you approach the world. It looks at it. Opsis, on the other hand, and, and in contrast, prerequisites technology before we have a, look, a world to look at. So technology creates the world we're looking at. Uh, it's mediated in the first instance, and then we can then look at it. It refers to the technology of making things visible. So the way instruments, codes, screens, and stages frame cultural production, and hence artistic practice, uh, is going through this obsess uh, staging, this kind of cosmological uh, theater, as we heard before. So the focus is not on what we already uh, think about the sun and the weather and what we think we know about it, but how technology constructs those uh, ideas and conceptions. So technology creates the grids, the diagrammatic fields that makes it possible for us to work at the threshold of post-human life, it seems. Lausten's work, all the works, exist at that threshold, not as visual representations, but as deep media metaphors. The demediation, the opsis, is the work in that sense, not the optical representation. And there's a quote from Peter Weibel from the book. Uh, we, we, um, I curated an exhibition with, with uh, Tobian Larsen in 2007 uh, for ZKM called Magnet. And uh, to, uh, Peter Weibel wrote this in, uh, in the introduction. Now we are on the threshold of a new period where the strict division between art and science is becoming obscure and obsolete. And we're still navigating that obscurity <coughs> and obsoleteness. Thorbjörn Lauston is one of the few artists at this stage advanced enough to be aware of this threshold. Um, I want to show you some footage here of uh, the exhibition uh, of Seoul at, at the ZKM. This is from 2004. Um, actually, what is interesting here is uh, the modality is investigating and it's an experimentation and, and he does not wish to exist inside the problem of representation. Instead, it becomes a discursive point, turning point in the systems of relations that are created in his digital data practice, or what I call digital data practice. Maybe it's not really that. I mean. That's the problem with metaphors, right? Yeah. So this was what I called it in the 2007, and maybe I should call it something else today. So in his works, uh, we do not see reality itself, but we construct it from the streams of data represented to us. 
we, we perceive in a sense that which we are not able to perceive by the, the, the use of the technology uh, that, that senses for us, or rather uh, through the, the screens, the screenings, the specials that, that uh, Token Thousand is making. So Sol here is making this point very visible. And of course here we have this media position as, as was mentioned before. Uh, we are passing, maybe there's a historicity, uh, I mean especially the exhibition, uh, you could say, progress process of how we, exhibit, how we are exhibiting this and how the artists are working. But in this, this time, in 2004, the screens, uh, the media arts uh, sensing here is, is really so strong. Uh, so, uh, Seoul is making this uh, point about uh, how, how the, the technology is making sensing possible, very, very visible, as it were, focusing on real-time data streams from different measurements of the sun, you know, magnetic fields and sunspot activity. Uh, it never really is able to represent that non-human world it is operating in this sense, in between technological driven categorizations and the post human perspective of life without categories. Where the, tech, uh, where, the, where the technological mediation and categories are interpretations based on trajectory at best. It's his trajectories, it's the artist making these trajectories and interpretations. But they are never firm, they are always in this passing and, and processual uh, state. So it's situated knowledge uh, only operational in the moment of the real-time interaction of the screen. Of, and of course you can also say there's an algorithm uh, here, that there's an algebra uh, calculus going on, making the interpretation of the, the data into visual fields and the sound as well. Um, so there's no interaction as such, as we heard before this. Uh, you could say this criticism of, of interaction is also very uh, uh, apparent in, uh, in the talk of last year. And he, he himself is, is uh, saying, well today as artists, this is in 2007, he says we had to put the investigation and consciousness of media behind us. This uh, media specificity, he, is, uh, he doesn't want to work there anymore, and this, of course it's also uh, connected to the interactivity. Um, instead, it says, we should move on and use the experience from the investigation in our practice as a part of and frame for our practice. So actually speaking to this, what, what Haraway was saying as well in, in, in my first quote, and this trouble uh, me as an art historian has to tag on to this and understand this through whatever metaphors we have in, in our uh, in our uh, uh, in my horizon. So Magnet, again, this is uh, the, the project uh, focusing on artistic expression and most importantly artistic <coughs> practice in a new situation based on uh, meteorological data. Here art is a field of visual systems contributing to a digital dialectic of negotiating, negotiating very different disciplines and fields and, and also negotiating this uh, notion of optics and opsis. Magnet is, an, uh, well, in this case, a, a sort of art system, like Saul was it also, but here it's more, even more apparent, that reflects upon the cultural status of art as post-human practice. And this is very, I think, very clear in 2007 that Chokyan was all, already thinking about that precision uh, how do we move it on that threshold? How, how is he operating there? What is the aesthetics of that? So the data projections and the optical effects uh, uh, they create in the exhibition space becomes windows, the doors, thresholds to the non-human world and in this sense uh, creating this opposite uh, situation or staging but clear, clearly not in concrete images see, or they may be concretist, but they're not uh, images that have symbolic uh, uh, power in such a way as a symbiotic sense. But they are opposites of optical data constructed from different scientific measurements and representational parameters. 
The data protection has become an interface between us and the point, uh, the, the non-human world, uh, what I also sometimes call the point one zero world, but goes to quite explain what that is. So it's an um, interface, you could say, that is realizable only through the externalized resonance of technology and science. Here in the words of Matthew K. Mike and Frederick Schiaffert, um, who is echoing uh, Michael Lynch, actually, from, uh, say technology, technology becomes, in, uh, in general, a corporeal uh, rooting and embodiment of scientific knowledge. And the instrument becomes an interface in which the actor meets these theoretical constituted objects in the form of observations on a kind of externalized retina. In a fundamental sense, the techno technical interface that thus constitutes the body's own experience, the experience boundary with the world, but projected towards us like a screen. So this is what I'm approaching as a threshold. This uh, situation, the, the situated uh, position taken out of, of, of Haraway, where we are, the, where we are in, in, in between uh, the, the, you could say, the human and the non-human, or the post-human and the non-human uh, situation. And this also, I want to connect to the UC Parika in the geology of media. Uh, well, according to, to UC Parika, it says that one can approach the Earth as an archive of different temporal blocks, each with its own rate and variability of change. This is, the, of course, in the book from uh, two years ago. So what we encounter, he says, are variations that define an alternative deep media, the deep time, sorry, the deep time strata of our media culture, and it offers an, an anarchology of surprises and differences. This, I find, is, is, uh, is, uh, is very, uh, interesting to, to think about when, when uh, approaching, well, in this case I'm re-approaching uh, Tobin and Lawson's work. I haven't actually looked at it, uh, well, it's always there, but, but I haven't been back and looking at this, these projects in, in 10 years. Um, so it's interesting to, to see that suddenly this, these projects are, this, this, this negotiation of the aesthetic threshold of the non-human and the post-human is, is uh, gets into, it becomes a different um, and more maybe uh, important uh, uh, theme in, in that until 10 years after, I mean today. And, and locked on to this interest uh, of, of the cosmological theater uh, from, uh, from uh, Pickering or from UC uh, Parker, uh, the geology of media. And this, uh, brings me to my third example, which has been, I mean, Stellark has been mentioned already uh, a couple of times, and then he's, uh, in that sense, already an important figure in this uh, conference. But I would like to, um, of course, I'm, I'm also, this is my third metaphor I'm investigating, and as you are sensing, these metaphors are not finished, they are imperfect. Uh, so the first was the memory, what is the memory is. Um, the threshold is, and here the body is. And of course, Stellark has a lot of uh, ideas about how to finish that metaphor. Uh, and you can say as an artist, uh, that's his privilege. I'm, I'm just concerned as a, an art historian that we need to be more uh, you know, investigative uh, about how that actually plays out when we use these metaphors and how we, we are approaching it. But, Stellar is addressing the body in a way which is pointing us towards a complex sets, a set of states, movements, and a synthetic practice of the awareness and of sensations and their prosthetic combinations in what Roy Asker also has termed moist, <coughs> moist art, um, could also be called moist media. Um, and uh, this prosthetic aesthetic impulse in, in Stellar's practice, I will argue is uh, a drive towards renegotiating, renegotiating the dynamic relation between the body and the mind as part of a prosthetic uh, uh, second nature, which is active in, a, in this wet, uh, uh, this moist zone, this wet zone. Thus, the large practice is a critique of the discourse uh, 
of, of the discourses of art, the, the way that, that we are approaching maybe also the, the idea of post-human life. Um, so he's, he's, he's investigating these discourses as well uh, in his practice. It's an, a, a critical and very rich review these practices of the ideas constructing our paradigm and, understand, and the understanding of what is human and what is art in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this way. So in his own word, in words, he has, uh, there's a quote, maybe, well, I will play a little uh, interview I had with him as well in a moment, but I found this, I, I found this quote, cry, cryogenically, cryogenically, <laughs> sorry, to cryogenically, there it was, suspended bodies await reanimation of, at some imagined future. Um, over are fertilized by sperm that was frozen, partially living entities that engineered in, in vitro. The dead, the near dead, the undead, and the yet to be born now exist simultaneously. There's some sense of, of catching on to this dementia uh, situation of Esmeri Hedder that I started out with, I think, especially what I would like to point out uh, is, is the, the way that he's approaching this ear of art. Uh, through the project of Internet Year that, uh, that we made for, for it's a, an exhibition uh, I did in, in, in Olvo called Bi Biotopia. And here is an interview, just briefly, uh, Stella talking about this project. I've always wanted to make a soft prosthesis for the body. The ear on arm is a project that involves surgically constructing and stem cell growing a life-scale human ear on my forearm. At present, it's only a relief of an ear. Uh, we have to still surgically lift the helix to create an ear flap and then, using extracted adult stem cells, grow a soft earlobe. Only then will we be able to reinsert the small microphone that's connected to a wireless transmitter in any Wi-Fi hotspot will internet enable the ear. So people in other places will be able to hear what the ear is listening to wherever I am and, and uh, wherever you are. So we've replicated a facial feature, we've relocated it to the arm and we will soon be rewiring it for additional capabilities. The Internet ear is an actualization of this idea. We've got four soft casts with uh, microphones uh, inserted, and these will be positioned in four different locations uh, one in Aalborg, one in, one in Copenhagen, one in Paris, and the other in Moscow. People in those physical locations will be able to speak to the ear. Their speech is interpreted into text and re-spoken with a synthesized voice. The synthesized voices will be heard in all of the locations by everyone who's participating. In addition, there's a website where if you type a text, then the system will uh, speak uh, your words. So this ear on the arm becomes not only a listening device, but a system that's also a speaking device. A circular cacophony of reverberating voices heard on the internet. But of the internet ear. So what we did was actually to, you could say, we gave the Stellar's arm dementia. It forgot all about where it came from because it, 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 it was uh, replicated in four uh, copies. And as he explained, one was in Moscow uh, with uh, Dimitri and uh, one in Paris and two in Denmark. And so the, what happened very quickly was that, that this voice-to-text recognition software, this is in 2.10, 
And of course, it didn't understand Russian, and of course, it didn't understand Danish. So it became gibberish, and and not symbolic. I mean, there's no semantic, um, almost no. I mean, there are traces of semantics, I would say, um, but then they become something else, right? So what he's saying at the end of this uh, talk is actually speaking to this threshold right here, this where these metaphors are are operating. Um, and also, I think that Stelak had that in mind. I have to say that if it, actually when he saw his arm, I mean, he never saw it until he arrived in, 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 uh, in Albo, but he did like it. And, uh, and what he didn't like as well was that there was a loss of control about light. I mean, he reacted to it, that there was a loss of control um, of what the arm did then. <laughs> And suddenly it was, you know, free. It was, as I say, it had dementia suddenly. I mean, it was outside the entanglement of, of Stellar's own body, which, of course, is the, the, the main, uh, you could say, the centerpiece of, of his work. I mean, his own work. Here it's a replica. And we then fitted it with all this technology, and it could listen to people, and it was hooked up to people, and all that. But uh, in a sense, it, it lost its. Um, it's, 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 uh, it, it lost the connection, uh, the semantic connection, and maybe also the, the, the aesthetic connection to the, to the original situation of, of this experiment of growing an, an ear. And it became something else. And um, I, would, I would argue that this, this is actually where it becomes a, a deep media situation, in a sense. And, and there's a metaphorical uh, setting here that is really interesting. So Perica, he uh, suggests that uh, we might learn from uh, natural uh, scientists trying to reach into the uh, humanities, that from philosophers trying to reach uh, more from natural scientists, I should say, than uh, to, that try to reach into the humanities, than from philosophers trying to reach into the natural sciences. And here I think that, that what is Stelag is doing as well is to have these uh, natural scientists, uh, this medical this uh, 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 vernacular of that world reaching into uh, what is uh, well, the human field, the post-human field. Um, so, and Perica, he draws on, on a, a model of evolutionary time as a punctuation equilibrium by Stephen J. Stephen J. Gould as a succession uh, of more or less stable states and uh, variation alternating with moments of more rapid change. There is no sense of progress in the version of deep time, no necessary evolution <coughs> from lower to higher, from simpler to complex. So here we have this situation where there's no, maybe, uh, no histor historicity, which is also interesting for an art historian, that, that you have this situation where you're actually not able to, to operate historically, but you have to uh, work with the metaphors of uh, um, the thresholds, the, 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 the memory, the temporality itself, um, and, and of course with the media. Yes, I'm coming through. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and here is another quote from We need carefully to refine what we mean by media communication and the non correlationalist, as well as a new materials, uh, materialist context of contemporary media culture, and this is, of course, what we're doing today. And uh, uh, yes, and this this quote also by Haraway is very important. I think that this, this sense of something that is made in a different context is a reality construction. Uh, and in this talk, I had investigated the media metaphors based on constructions of reality artists made, not made up, but they made them. The metaphors seem unfinished; they are fluid. Yes, and the fluidity is. Uh, and the point towards three, the point pointing towards three areas of uncertain post-human life was memory beyond Renaissance humanism and cogito, thresholds of non-human and post-human, and the body. Yes, and I'm just, I just I couldn't I couldn't help having this because sunshine is the best medium, and then thank you. Yes, I'm finished. <laughs> There's an upcoming conference, uh, Politics and Machines. There's a deadline tomorrow, well, day after tomorrow actually. Still open, it's in Beirut, it's an island conflict. And there is a conference in Albor in, in August next year on, on media histories. Uh,
Спасибо большое, Мартон. Я надеюсь, мы встретимся, конечно же, в Альбанке в августе следующего года. Я хотел поблагодарить вас. Я представляю следующего участника программы конференционной с, с презентацией художника. Это группа, это Себастьян Нич, группа Квадратура. На сегодняшний день группа Квадратура является очень динамически развивающейся художественной единицей, которая уже стала заметным такой заметной фигурой на пространстве технологического искусства. Юлиана Гетц и Себастьян Нич. Да, да. За последние годы представили целый ряд интереснейших проектов, которые были выставлены и являются лауреатами различных фестивалей. Группа получила несколько грантов развития и приняла участие в очень значимых выставках, как фестиваль Арсенектроника, ЦКМ, музеи, ну и тому подобное прочее. То есть сейчас группа квадратура является такой наиболее... Раз, два, три.
just have to speak up a bit. Right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and I have no idea what Dimitri just said about me, so I'm just maybe repeating it. So, um, I'm Sebastian, I'm a part member of I'm a member of Quattratura. Uh, we used to be three until 2016, and after that it's just you and me, so by right now we are a duo. Uh, the works that you see downstairs are rather old, they're like two, two to three years old, and uh, they are still with Jan Bernstein, who was a member back then. Um, yeah, I don't really like to call us a media art, or now maybe deep media art collective. Um, uh, these, for me, these are definitions that are created because, yeah, society, the art world, academic and gallery, whatever, all of them, they, they need definitions, they need to categorize, but uh, we just do what we do. And um, for me, it's okay that it usually needs a few sentences to explain what I do. Um, so, it's a pleasure to do this talk the first time in Russia, actually. Having Yuri back there also, it's uh, quite interesting. And so, for us, it's very important to talk about the very first machines that were sent to space. So, this is Sputnik, the very, very famous satellite launched in '57 that orbited Earth for about three weeks. And for us, what is important, because people ask us very often why we work with um, astronomy data and uh, deep space, I usually the spark is because of the story. And I like this story very much because what this created, it created the so-called Sputnik shock in the US. And because this was just a proof of concept. So all this did was like a beep, beep. And the uh, researchers, uh, the scientists in Russia just used this to know that this thing is still working. It was just basically a higher beam. That's all this thing did, nothing else. But for the US Americans, uh, for who it was very easy even for amateurs, radio amateurs, to hear the signal, they were shocked, like, what is this thing doing? We don't know, we can hear it, it's like passing by, it's returning. It was really creating quite a shock. And um, of course, it was like total war and stuff, and anyway, the tensions were high, but unfortunately, that seems to happen again. And um, so they had no, that this was actually before Sputnik because they were kind of fearing that something like this would happen. Uh, they started a program, this is before NASA, even, called um, Operation Moonwatch. There's a very nice book from Trevor Pagan about this, by the way. And um, it's, I would say, at least from my point of knowledge, one of the most successful um, citizen science projects, because they didn't really have the means automatically to track the sky. So what they did is they asked college students, etc. They had really a program uh, where just normal citizens were used or trained to look at the skies, um, write down, document what they saw, uh, and all the allied countries, Australia, Britain, etc. So it should be like kind of global, of course. Um, to track the sky. This went on until 75, like over 30 years. So very, very successful. And this is the data which is still used. It's a two-line element, a three-line element, and it depends on, on the definition. A data, and this is an example of, I would say right now, the most famous object orbiting Earth, the ISS. Um, and it's more or less all based on, on Kepler's orbit mechanics. Well, that's kind of very simplified, but uh, there's a huge database that since then was for a very long time maintained by the NASA. Now it's unfortunately, I feel unfortunately, maintained by the US Air Force. Um, and they have, they track every object that is bigger than 10 centimeters. Uh, most of this database, more than 90% is free, is trash. Um, and you can download this data and you just, there are like RPs you can find and you just put in the time and what you get is something like this. So this would be like a visualization uh, looking through the poles of all the paths of all human-made objects. There are only about eight military satellites in this catalog, which obviously is not enough. 
Um, so this Operation Moonwatch people, they stopped work in 75. Um, but, well, they didn't really stop. Basically, NASA told them to stop because they had big telescopes to do it automatically. But these people have done that for, you know, decades, and they were really good at it. So right now, there's not a very big, but a very dedicated group, also uh, actually quite a lot in, in Russia, who look at these official databases, and they look at the sky, and whenever something doesn't fit, they create their own database. And you can actually find this, it's not very easy, and you have to kind of find it there, and there, and there. And you can find uh, these data of classified objects, also Trevor Pagan, by the way, again, this is quite a big inspiration for us. I did a quite interesting work on this, where he took photos of those officially non-existent objects. But there are about 450 of those objects in the skies that are not in the official database. But most of them have Wikipedia entrances, people know what it is because they were, yeah, it's, it's not so hard sometimes to actually figure out what's up in space. It's nice because space, by definition, is kind of public, it's very hard, hard to hide stuff in there, even so it's very big. Um, but there are about uh, 50, kind of a changing number, currently about 52 objects where there's absolutely no information. There's one, so the, well, actually there's several amateur astronomers, astronomers who saw these objects and calculated the path and put them in a database. But there's, you cannot, like it's very hard to see them. They didn't see them good enough to kind of have an idea what it is. You only get the position. And even the so-called TLD data and the NOVA number, which is kind of an IP, is usually just unknown. And what we did is we did two works with these unknown um, objects. Uh, this is just prints, so this is anodized black aluminium, and we we uh, captured the data. It's just like a digital long-time exposure, if you want to say so, and uh, laser engraved that in black aluminium plates, and you get these really, really beautiful shapes. Uh, for us, also historically, like for us ourselves, it's interesting because we worked a lot with generative art before and creating shapes which are based purely on mathematics and physical necessities but that are kind of from a real object that resemble what we did before which were purely just because of aesthetics or whatever. I mean, we kind of we worked a lot in the VJ world and this kind of stuff. This was a kind of interesting conversation to our later work, to our earlier work. Um, then the next work we did, let's see if the sound is working here. Uh, it's not. Okay. Well, maybe I'll fix, try to fix this later. So, um, the next thing we did, we used, so this is all the data, it's kind of running through on the, on the left. Um, the next thing is we did, we built 52 little pointers that we put into the exhibition space. But in real time, so they, so there's a little computer, and for every exhibition, I have to pay, I have to put the location, and I have to check that they all face north, so that everything is correct, and I have to put the right time. But that's basically it. Um, they just point in real time at those objects, and the idea here is to kind of try to give a sense that these objects are there. Because otherwise it's just an idea. But how can we bring this idea into reality somehow? And, and it's really interesting because we have to believe these amateur astronomers. And you have to believe us. Because this kind of stuff, I hear this very often, it's so easy to fit. Like, would anybody know if we, if we, if this is not real vision? Probably not, because it's very, very hard to prove this, if not even impossible for any normal person. Um, and also these objects move rather slow for human perception. So this is all time lapse. Um, which is another reason why we really love to work with uh, space, because in space, time and space itself are so far away from the normal human scale that automatically they kind of become abstract and create an interesting aesthetic. I don't really have to do anything as artists, I just take it, grab it, and put it, and that's it. And it's always interesting. So, kind of very easy to work with. Um, so, yeah, this is a very nice um, quote from Trevor Pagan. I like this a lot um, because it kind of points out how, yeah, even even the 
all this, I don't know, whatever you do out there, you like, yeah, this is what has to be like that. Um, then, next kind of set, so this is a rather older project, which are also finished for us. Like, we, we worked, we had a lot of works with the satellite data because it was so interesting for us, but um, in 2016, we were lucky to get a residency from the Ars Electronica to visit the uh, European Southern Observatories of Chile, and uh, the two largest, still largest ground-based telescopes in the visual and in the radio uh, wavelength, so like uh, visual stuff and radio. And this is an apex, which is uh, at, in about 5,000 meters altitude. It's kind of a test telescope for the big Alma cluster. Uh, and those, this was amazing. They like they like stopped there. Like they, they had actually they, they 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 did some scientific stuff there. They just stopped it and wanted to show us how fast the telescope could go. And it was on the right. It was quite amazing. And it's really out of the world. Like this is really on the edge. So the atmosphere is thin. When you go up there, you have to take a blood test. You, you get like these oxy oxygen bottles and masks, and it feels like a moon base or something. It's really like on the threshold of the sky, so it was, was an amazing experience. And this is Juliana, my partner, by the way. Um, and radio astronomy is very interesting because it also generated these crazy stories. And this is one of uh, the discovery of the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. And it's actually 60, ooh, 60, 67, I'm not sure, some, some, sometimes in the 60s. This is a horn antenna from Sears and Wilson. I think they even got the Nobel Prize for accidentally actually discovering uh, the cosmic micro radiation, which is one of the most important proofs of the Big Bang. It's kind of an afterglow of the Big Bang when hydrogen atoms uh, formed for the first time and uh, the photons could move freely in a then just becoming transparent universe. And just because time is very long, energy goes down and these wavelength kind of stretch. It's why it's not visible anymore for us. So in the early universe, everything would glow. Now everything is dark, but that's just because energy and wavelength get longer. And it's now in a non-visible radio um, wavelength. And when they started this thing, they had this noise. They didn't know what it is. And there were actually pigeons um, living in there, and they thought, it's a poop of pigeons that created this noise, and then they like had a really big operation and cleaned the telescope, and they still had it there. And yes, it took quite a lot of uh, guessing and, and calculating, and they had another theorist, I unfortunately forgot his name, who then suggested this. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. This is the first fluctuations in matter. Like, the, the universe at the beginning was very uniform in a way, but there were little temperature fluctuations, which then, if you scale it up, created all the um, clusters of matter galaxies and stuff. Otherwise, it would just be nothing or everything, whatever. And um, what we like, so this is one very interesting story about how this happened. The second very interesting story, on the very lower right on this, um, I didn't mark it here, unfortunately. There's, there's a lot of blue spots, but there's one blue spot which they cannot explain mathematically. Like, it doesn't make any sense that there's such a cold spot. It's called the very cold spot. It's, this is kind of a zoom into that. It's just in the center of blue stuff. And um, they don't know what it is, actually. Like, they can't explain it. It doesn't make any sense. But there's a very, like, so it's really a serious um, theory by a Albanian uh, theory, theory physicists or cosmologists, I forgot her name, I should mention her name, it's kind of important. Um, and so it's, it's Laura Marzini, she, she is a professor at the University of North Carolina, originally from Albania, and she said this cold spot is there, it's because it's a ditch that happened because of an accident. In the very, very early beginning of time, our time, um, you have to imagine a little bit like, like a soup with a lot of bubbles coming up, and our universe was one bubble, but there were a lot of other parallel universes, and sometimes they bumped into each other. And this is the bump of a parallel universe bumping into us. 
It's kind of like the, the very first accident in history, if you could say. And um, we, we loved this a lot. We, we, we thought about this analogy of a car crash or something. If you would be inside the car, when another car comes in, you have like a bump that goes in like that. And so um, we made a 3D representation where like blue and red was transferred to Z. Um, and then and then created a brass sculpture out of it by milling. Um, so we worked with a lot of different mediums. It's very complicated because we always have to pay other people to do it because we can't monster everything, unfortunately. So this is just milled. Uh, we call it POM, a P O M. It's a plastic that's very good for milling. We did a negative and a positive, and then we did brass to press it. Um, so this is how the sculpture looks like. It's very, very recent work, and um, there are actually one of the reasons why we why we do this. So this is this is called the very cold spot. It's a true representation of this theory of the parallel universe. Um, one of the reasons why we also started to do sculptures and prints, and this is a big thing, I could fill a whole talk with this, is we are honestly trying to also get into the gallery market because with the field we do, it's very like I, we work a lot in this kind of field, a lot with the academics and with arts electronica, but it's very difficult with this kind of stuff to be accepted in a, yeah, to be honest, more commercial but very classical way of making money with your art. And uh, one way we're trying to do this right now is uh, doing stuff like this, which has a more classical representation of our concepts. Um, so um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, pulsars. Um, this is a very bad representation, I believe, because the Earth looks like it's very close to a pulsar. Luckily, that's not the case, otherwise we would be in a very bad situation. So a pulsar is, you can also call it a failed black hole. It's the, beside the black hole, the most densest object we know. Um, these are the remains of dead stars, so it's like a star if it's heavy enough or not too heavy. If it explodes, then part, parts of the exploding matter won't make it away because gravity works against it. It will collapse due to gravity to a very, like, there's no fusion anymore, there's no energy that, that, that keeps that matter apart from each other. It all collapses, basically like the huge nucleum that's created. There's not really any, any atoms anymore. It's just a very heavy thing. These things are like the mass of the sun, the size of Manhattan. It's a crazy object. It spins rapidly because of velocity force. So this thing was big, was rotating, got very small, still rotating, rotates faster like an ice skater that does these motions. You, 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 should, you can all easily experience this. And they rotate very, very rapidly but also very constant. It's like a metronome of the skies. And, um, and very fast, like milliseconds sometimes, or once a second. So for, for such an object, that's crazy. And there's a very nice uh, catalog by the Australian, Australian Institute of Radio Astronomy or something like this. Um, by the way, I, like, I love that logo. This is when you like work with, with all these scientific data. I, I always I love this logo stuff. Yeah. And um, it's a great public, great public catalog. You just type in what you want, and you, they spit out this thing and the shape. You can sort the, the, the stuff by, by anything. Like you can sort it by speed, you can sort it by distance, you can sort it by discovery date. It's really amazing what you can do with this. And um, the first, oh yeah, this is the, the, the story behind this. Is the first time this was discovered in it was actually a student back then, PhD student, also for that. So that was nice. Um, and she, she should of course got it, unfortunately. Um, she, she heard the signal and it was such a such a constant rhythmical signal that they couldn't really, they thought it either the Russians, of course, or um, aliens. And they called it the little green man, and this is also how we call the word. Little green man. Uh, and this is how we usually start when we work with data. So this is just where. Oh, sorry, this is. I'm not used to Mac. Okay. So this is this is this. I just wrote a little program. We are we are interested in patterns. Like when you see these this data in a list, it doesn't really tell much. But 
to kind of trying to dig into it. Like we usually start with a story that's interesting. We don't even yet know what to do with the data. Then we try to write little programs to search for patterns. And this is uh, sorted all of them by uh, speed, by how, how fast they rotate. And then I just put a number that counts up per object. This is about 2,600 different numbers, just counting up. And you can see these patterns kind of like walking through. Um, then what we did with this were two different works. So this is a very, very basic uh, LED work. We just have one pixel representing one star. And uh, each pixel is blinking in the speed of each representing star. And that's it, basically. And it creates this, this kind of pattern. So this is a very little movie we did for Instagram. Um, yeah, so... I don't know, there's not much more to say to this. Like for me, the, the objects we do are very often very, very simple. But, and that's totally okay for me, they need a lot of text besides it to really make sense. And I, I work, it was a very hard discovery for us that this is how it works for us. Like, I always thought that if I want to go to a gallery space, the best thing is if I immediately understand everything and it's amazing. I totally disagree now. Like, I really think, like, it's like, if you, if you would see a science, like, if you would read an article from science, like, you would not expect to understand this without any other knowledge. And I think for art, very often it's quite similar. Um, so now I would really love to have sound, um, because now I, we, we started doing sound stuff. I, it seems like it doesn't see the... Let's see if I can figure this out. It's quite Russian. <laughs> Is there anybody who can help me out with this? Maybe the, the source? Does that do anything? No. So you, you can mark so it's up here somewhere? So, um, we, are, we luckily right now have a residency funding something with the ZKM that goes on for three years and the idea is to build our own CT uh, telescope device. So CT is a rather um, well-known cluster of programs, radio telescopes in the search for extraterrestrial life, intelligent life, so basically searching for radio signals. And um, it, we, we want actually to build a artificial intelligence or a machine learning algorithm or artificial intelligence to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The idea is a little bit, it's really at the very beginning of this project, we just started. The idea is basically to write um, machine learning algorithms that try to interpret a radio, like this super noisy and very foreign 
a radio sound. I mean, radio is not sound, by the way, it's just light, but which is interpreted as sound, um, as kind of human sounds. And the idea is to kind of make music or also speech, uh, sound performances, usually uh, based on radio input. Um, this is the very first try where we just, because Um, so they have this huge 52-channel um, sound dome with 50, 52 different um, bit of sound there. 52 different um, speakers hanging in a dome, and this is the very first try where we just have the same pulsar data. This is kind of because now we're starting now we're kind of trying to play with the instrument and the real data maybe later. And we're working on a performance right now that basically does this. It takes this pulsar data and it creates these uh, clicks and pulses and also sign of curves based on that. We kind of like shift through the data but also the speed is all based on, on the data itself. We usually try to stick very raw. Well. And this is just from yesterday in our studio. We ordered a telescope dish from China. Quite excited about the compact I've put this together. Um, this is us trying to. Uh, this is a German television channel that we kind of hook into with, with radio at the Teufelsberg. It's an old uh, American spy facility in Berlin. Um, this is a light meteor stream from North America that we hooked up to a. MIDI piano is actually very, very similar here to, to um, Laos, the, the, the Sun data project in a way. Uh, I was very surprised to see this. I, I, I did not know that project. I, I'm very ashamed of it. Um, so I have to speak through a little bit. Um, and uh, since we always want to build machines, this is kind of using the same data, it's using meteor data. And it's a lot of solenoids that react on power. Um, and it's basically um, just like what we, we, we get the meteor, and when the meteor comes in from this live stream, we're actually going to build our own meteor tracking system. It generates um, electronic current, like it's one pixel per solenoid or magnet, and runs through and creates this. Uh, sound kinetic work. Uh, this is very recent. We just uh, finished this uh, last Friday. And I'll show you this one. And yeah, there's so much more I want to talk about, but I have to finish. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, Себастьян. Uh, теперь у нас uh, остается 15 минут, и я до перерыва. Uh, это с, бы, хорошее время для того, чтобы пригласить uh, всех выступавших в этой панели uh, вот там, расположиться на стульях. This Adam is this. Adam, I have here. Uh, we have received in the field of the field. We have received four images. Yes, yes. Uh, мы получили четыре картинки на входе в конференцию. Uh, Дмитрий Галкин uh, как бы разложил некую свою классификацию подход. Uh, после этого Адам uh, Браун зашел uh, в технобиологию. Мортон предложил uh, некоторые концепции uh, памяти как глубокого подхода 
И э, я очень рад, что композиционно картинка за, э, как бы закончилась э, Себастьяном, который э, нарисовал нам э, возможности работы художника э, с глубоким космосом. И везде вы слышали и видели, что э, как бы звучит пока как метафора вот, упоминания о глубоком. На мой взгляд, это не спроста. Почему мы и решили сфокусироваться на этой теме? Первое, как мы и говорили, что вот, смысл открытой дискуссии, она так и называется, открытая дискуссия, смысл заключается в том, чтобы у присутствующих была возможность спросить, задать свои вопросы по тем докладам, которые были сделаны. Это могут быть не вопросы и не относящиеся непосредственно к проблематике их доклада, но к проблематике панели, поскольку каждый из участников преимущественно является и у нас есть два художника, и художника, даже четыре художника, и, собственно, как вы видели, художники являются также, в общем, блестящими теоретиками. Если вы хотите задать вопрос, сделать э, концептуальный вброс, э, дабы возжечь э, огонь дискуссии, я предлагаю вам это сделать. Э, представляйтесь, пожалуйста, а дальше посмотрим, как пойдет. Здравствуйте. У меня общая реплика по поводу, скорее, доклада Дмитрия Галкина, ну и в целом того, что называется Art and Science. Мне кажется, что эта область все-таки является довольно консервативной в политическом, социальном, культурном, в каком угодно смысле, потому что она консервирует текущее состояние научного знания. Это может выглядеть в некоторых проектах Art and Science как попытка предвосхищения развития науки, но в конечном итоге речь всегда идет о фиксации каких-то ну, достаточно даже тривиальных открытий в области научного знания. И мне кажется, это как раз препятствует новым научным революциям, в связи с чем я думаю, что для достижения большего больше свободы художественного творчества, нужно стремиться скорее к art and parascience, к паранаучным исследованиям, к визуализации различных, не только современных паранаук, но и различных этапов исследований, как там, физических, так и химических, сегодняшние историки науки, ну, в таком не, не социологи, а именно историки, британская школа исследований на, науки, История науки демонстрирует огромное количество очень странных кейсов в развитии термодинамики или оптики. Мне жаль, что пока что это не находит отражение в работах современных художников, хотя, ну, опять же, сегодня мы видели работы, посвященные в том числе астрономии, но астрономия наиболее, мне кажется, как бы не осязаемая наука, и мы можем в ближайшие годы быть свидетелем каких-то совершенно странных изменений в этой области, тогда как сегодняшняя работа скорее демонстрирует, чем астрономия была для, или является для нас там, 50 лет назад во времена изобретения тех же радиотелескопов. То есть, если подытожить мой месседж, Лучше, мне кажется, интереснее было бы двигаться в сторону паранауки, а не консервировать современное состояние науки. Спасибо, Михаил. Я расцениваю это как довольно серьезное предъявление обвинения художникам и представителям Мартон Сайенс в недостатке паранаучности. Я со своей стороны готов сразу же парировать, что область философии, которая представляет... Михаил, ну, 
философия как дисциплина, как науки, мне кажется, уравновешивает эту ситуацию и э, в свойственном ей парафилософском ключе. Э, и я думаю, что Михаил нам еще продемонстрирует, так что э, здесь мы будем выдерживать баланс. Но поскольку, э, как говорится, как бы обвинение, перчатка брошена, если э, у присутствующих есть э, что сказать в свое оправдание, либо сказать э, в оправдании направления, деятельности, э, мне кажется, что э, да, здесь есть уже о чем говорить. Ну, это действительно хороший заход, особенно про э, фарнау. Я, с одной стороны, вот, с базовой идеей, что арт-энсайенс консервативная штука, консервативная, в смысле консервирующая, я согласился бы, э, но немножко в другом, с немножко другим акцентом, потому что э, наука, если мы ее вот так мыслим, какую-то глубину, которая вот, сама в себе консервативная и не шевелится, это не так. Наука динамичная, внутри паранаучная, местами мутная. И в этом смысле вот относительно нее про консерватизм говорит, можно просто попасть пальцем в небо, поскольку вот она не, не, не такая. Вот. С другой стороны, <coughs> это замечание не совсем соответствует действительности, потому что если мы посмотрим на скажем, эксперименты в области э, биологии, нейрофизиологии, тем, чем занимается симбиотика и занималась, то это очень известная австралийская группа, работающая с технобиологическим искусством, то практически все, что они делали, было на острие науки. Вот. На тот момент, когда выходили работы, и по перепрограммированию стволовых клеток, и по нейронным интерфейсам. Это было даже не, вот, не на острие, а прямо еще на формирование этого острия. И в этом смысле художники скорее делали обратную работу, расталкивая какие-то горизонты перед учеными, что может художественная интервенция в развитии науки. Ну и в целом я бы сказал, что по большому счету художники науки ничего не должны, а пара науки тем более. Поэтому то, как они используют консервативно или наоборот, как бы сказать, слишком фривольно или еще как-то научные знания, это не говорит об их обязательствах перед наукой. Вот, вот вообще. И у них обязательства только перед искусством. Поэтому сама постановка вопроса тоже. Да, не очень. Но, но она интересна. Спасибо. Коллеги, если вам а, есть а, что а, сказать, а, почему, а, как так случилось, что, что художники, по мнению Михаила, недостаточно а, как бы, выходят в область паранаучности? Yes. So what is not normal science uh, according to whom? What, uh, what are not the... So the first science is what is not, what is uh, the, the normal science is according to Thomas Kuhn. So what are uh, the uh, well-known preconditions and known, well-known representations of what the science does and so on. Uh, it's, it's okay. Okay, well, I think <coughs> there are several ways we can take this and we don't have time, but... There are two things that I want to mention. The one is what I already kind of presented, because science and uh, art are, are negotiations of certain uh, influences and certain energies, you could say. And I think, in one sense, in terms of influence, in terms of metaphorical impact, there's a lot of science in art. Um, you could say, and that's the second example I have, maybe in sound art. Sound being Let's say acoustics being the, the one of the uh, um, one of the discoveries uh, uh, from thermodynamic early ages to early times of thermodynamics, right? Like 
and especially now the Danish physicist uh, who also discovered magnetic data or the magnetic the, the mag magnetism, uh, electromagnetism as well, um, uh, in the early 1820s, 30s. These metaphors, they, they impacted, on, and a lot of that was, I know they impacted Hatchbury's and Anderson, for instance. So his adventures actually, you could read them as, as thermodynamic uh, tales of the vibrating souls instead of objective souls. So the, the whole, the, this, this is the spectrum of ideas. So you could say science is not only the results, it's also the ideas coming out of science. And I think, I have to say, I could show a lot of examples of how science is impacting now. And one of the examples I want to maybe give, just to, to, to wrap it up, and that's, that's the second point, that's sound art. I think you can have a lot of examples showing that, that in the reverberation, the, the, the notion of uh, a resonant uh, reality space, for instance, whatever that is, the energy, uh, all these invisible forces that science are telling us about. Other then the, 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 the interesting thing about quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, for instance, because I don't understand what it is, you know, how do I see what, if there is something of the quantum uh, mechanics?